Um, so yeah, first thing I have to admit, well, I mean, my excuse is like Dan has done it as well. Uh, the actual presentation has been built on React. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and what's your name? Ju. Ju. Yes. So um, I wanted to just like talk a little bit about machine learning because I found it extremely interesting. And Jamie was really kind, and he said yes. So here I am. Um, so uh, my name is Ju. You can find me online on Twitter as Arcam with a four. And I work for a company here in London which is called Alpha Sites. Um, you should check it out. And we have a lot of my colleagues here. And also Ed is leaving today, so please give it out for Ed. Um, so we're just going to play a game at first, which is um, I'm going to show you um, some stills from a couple of movies, and you have to say the name of the movie. Are you guys ready? Blade Runner, right? Close. <laughs> Eventually. Eventually, right. Come on, come on. Aliens. Good one, good one. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> good. Good, much better. Um, so uh, if you think about uh, you know, like artificial intelligence uh, in computer science, uh, we're always talking about how like, computer science should, like artificial intelligence should be how computers do stuff that humans do, right? Um, instead, if you think about like, what movies has, has taught us, usually computer intelligence is nothing like humans. Actually, like, computer intelligence is usually quite alien, usually has a certain disregard for the human life or lives. And it's just like something that humans like, don't really understand really well or at all. Um, so for me, it was always kind of weird that when we're talking about artificial intelligence, we're actually trying to, do, to make computers do exactly what human beings are doing. So when I learned about machine learning, I thought, well, this just like, looks something more like the movies has, ta has taught me, right? So it's something where the machine sort of like, learns about itself. You don't really understand what the machine is doing. At some point, the machine will like, turn, tell you that the answer is something. And yeah, like, you can't really you know, like, discuss with the machine at that point. So I thought it was cool just like, to show a little bit of a slideshow initially of like, what actually you are using every day, which has been built in machine learning. So uh, I think the boringest part, like the most boring part of this thing is image processing because we have a technology which is called OCR, which I'm sure most of you fam are familiar with, which I'm sure most of your grandparents are familiar with. Mostly because this was invented at this point almost um, 30 years ago, right? And the idea is quite simple. There's like some um, numbers and some characters which are written by um, a human and the computer is able to recognize that. And we always take this completely for granted, but if I asked you as like part of your weekly iteration to build this uh, in the next iteration, do you think you would be able to do that? Any takers? No? What's the challenge? You have two weeks to re-implement OCR. I have two weeks to implement OCR, I will mm. use early solution. <laughs> very good, very good. Uh, so I think there's a very nice uh, comic from XKCD, uh, which is really about like this issue, right? Uh, so if you want to build uh, an app which checks, which like a user can take a picture, and you have to check if it's taking this picture in a um, natural park, uh, it's super easy. You just like get the GPS information, you check if that uh, coordinates are inside the park, and you get it. But then as soon as you have to uh, understand if the picture is representing a bird, you're like, yeah, I don't know. Seems pretty hard. Usually it takes five years in a research team, right? Apparently someone in the world has these sort of research teams because when I upload pictures uh, on the internet, there's like some like weird algorithms which are able to recognize where are the faces of the people like in, in the picture, which I think is strikingly similar to how like Terminator operates, right? Because if you want to, you know, if you want to resolve the, the human issue, you understand where the hat is and try to address that. I, I, I Here we go. I can do this in two weeks. Okay. That's great. Website with free movies. Mm -hmm. And to download the movie, you have to tell if there's a bird on the photo or not. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Some SEO and it's working. 
Yeah, sure. But let's say you can't use any existing library. You have to build it from scratch. Yeah, yeah. No and you can use it. I would use human intelligence. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure that this is how Facebook is doing it. They actually have like really a lot of human beings who just like like you know like selecting the faces of the people in the pictures. Um, <laughs> So this is all fun and, and all, but then like there's this company uh, which is called Google, which has been developing these uh, self-driving cars, and like this car has has <laughs> been already tested uh, on the uh, like on the streets for like almost like a billion miles, right? This car has been driving already for a billion miles, and probably in 10 years, if this technology actually works, it means like all the people right now are driving for a living; they won't have a job, which is yeah. Um, okay, so let's switch to something more interesting, language processing. So uh, as modern like citizens of the modern world, you're familiar with something which we call spam. And luckily there's like some programs which are aptly named to destroy the spam. And uh, all these programs are, are actually like application of machine learning techniques. So uh, like, like to detect if an email is spam is a typical machine learning task. You get the email, you have to understand if it's actually your grandma sending you the recipe of her cookies or is like this uh, Nigerian prince who wants to give you a fortune. I'm not talking about the Richie. Um, other than that, there's also stuff which is called sentiment analysis, which is quite important if you're a politician, maybe a politician. And well, it's really important for politicians. And basically, the idea is that you get a lot of like raw data, like tweets or Facebook posts, and you're trying to understand like how people feel about Trump or Hillary, like, just like from the text of the tweet. Uh, something really interesting I've just like read about this matter is that apparently Trump has two uh, devices: he has an iPhone and has an Android phone. And uh, someone ran a text analysis on the tweets that Trump writes and has figured out that whenever he writes from the Android, his tweets are more aggressive, they're more like flammatory, they try to like insult his opponent. And for example, whenever he's posting from his Android phone, he never uses uh, um, tags, right? Probably he doesn't understand and that's my theory. Um, but whenever he's using his uh, iPhone, He's always using tags. He's always like complimenting like the U.S. Olympic team, and he's like being like very you know like politically correct. So the theory in that article is that actually uh, Trump actually has a Samsung Galaxy, and we know that for a fact. And probably his PR team has an iPhone or something like that. Uh, and actually, if you read the article, you can actually see like the split of the usage of the term. So whenever he's like on his iPhone, he's like bad, evil, problem, and stuff like that. It's pretty interesting. Um, so you should vote for him. Um, <laughs> or like when you're using like Siri or like whenever, wh whichever program you try to tell the computer something and the computer has to understand it. Um, to keep like the um, talk interesting, we're going to talk about games, right? And usually games are fun and all, but then there's this guy who is apparently one of the best players of Go in the whole world, and he played against them, a certain machine built actually here in London by DeepMind, and he lost quite badly. I think 5-1? 4-1, yeah. And in the past 20 years, Go has always been the go-to game um, to basically, uh, uh, to basically uh, showcase the fact that computers aren't as smart as human beings. Because in Go, there are so many combinations. As soon as two players start to put like four pebbles, the number of like, combinations explode so rapidly that we always use the game as a way to prove, oh, well, computers are dumb. Like, we humans are smarter than that. Like, we can do better than machines. And apparently it's not true anymore. And like all the machine learning experts were thinking, well, probably in the next 15, 20 years, we have like an actual program which will beat uh, um, like a real champion. And apparently the future is here because um, yeah, it's quite scary. I think like a lot of like uh, professional like Go players, professional Go, you know, just like enthusiasts were really shocked by this. Like nobody expected a nine dan champion to be beaten by a machine. Um, which is fair. Um, so there's this, there's, this is the same company who developed um, AlphaGo. And it's called DeepMind. It's based here in London. You should apply. Hopefully, they'll get you. Um, I just want to show they built this little program which learns to play Atari games. And 
uh, basically, at the beginning of the game, he doesn't really understand what breakout is. I'm sure you guys are familiar with like what breakout is. There's a ball, there's like bricks. Like you don't have to ball, let the ball. Oh no, my internet isn't working. Is it right? Oh, okay, awesome. So uh, this is like 10 minutes uh, in the training. Uh, you see, like the the computer is pretty dumb. Like it doesn't really understand like what the goal is. It's just like let's the you know, ball fall down. Like come on, whatever. Um, but. And this is like 10 minutes inside the train. He's just like trying like to press some buttons. And basically what the machine learning algorithm is doing is like trying to optimize the score, right? And after 120 minutes of playing, I think it plays pretty well, right? And this is basically how I think like anyone like starts like playing um, Breakout, like when you understand like what the goal of the game is, and then at some point you lose because the ball is too fast, or uh, I don't know, like you don't understand stuff, right? Um, after another two hours of training, the machine learning algorithm understands something: is that it, if it's able to dig a tunnel um, in one side of the wall, it doesn't have to do anything because the ball will like will like clear stuff like uh, by itself. Pretty like lazy algorithm, right? <laughs> Com typical like computer scientist, um, and they built this like general purpose program to play Atari games. So when the game starts, the algorithm doesn't even know what the game is, like doesn't know like what the goal is. It just knows that he has to optimize a certain score, and that's it. Uh, which I find is really fascinating. Um, I can't see my no no. Mm. no. I should. Find again my cursor. Okay, it's here. We're back. Oops, maybe. Let me try here. Aha, React. Yeah, React. There was, oh, okay, cool. We have another video here. Awesome. Um, so, um, there's this guy who built this uh, neural network to play Mario. Actually, some Mario's like Welcome Super back, Mario. Seppling here. Whoa, whoa, whoa. You're watching a skilled player play Super Mario World, but this player is not human. It's a computer program I wrote called Mario. This program started out knowing absolutely nothing about Super Mario World or Super Nintendo's. In fact, it didn't even know that pressing right on the controller would make the player go towards the end of the level. It learned all of these things through a process called neuroevolution. In this video, I want to teach you about how Mario learned to beat this level, Donut Plains 1 what his brain looks like, and how it's all based on actual biological evolution. So let's start out by actually looking at Mario's brain. Um. Let's play it again, but this time we'll look at Mario's brain as it's made ease. So it's a simplified view of the level. So basically, like, it, like this is like how the algorithm views the world. There's Mario somewhere, there's like um, some obstacles, and on the right, uh, you'll able to see at some point that there are uh, the uh, where is it? The, the possible keys which he can play like while playing the game. And what you see inside here, this like mesh, is actually the brain, the neural network. And basically depending on where Mario is and where uh, like how the environment looks like, it decides which keys to press. And initially it's really, really like fun because you see like the, the program like when he starts and he doesn't really understand stuff, it would just do it's complicated, like, go straight. But it's enough to make at least some progress in the level. And do this thousands Let's take a look at a and thousands and thousands of times. Let's understand just how that works. Um, but this is one of the randomly generated. Uh, well, but eventually he'll get like smarter and he build a huge neural network and he'll be able to play that game like uh, we saw before, um, which is pretty sweet. Um, come on. The neural networks that appear. Aww. Where's my cursor? Why can oh, okay, it's here back. Um, okay, good. One more video and yeah, we can like show something more different. So actually, this is an application of machine learning techniques to uh, robotics. So they wanted to. They had this uh, skeleton of different types of animals, and this skeleton has a uh, muscular like a, a certain like uh, structure which like the muscle like were connected with, right? And they wanted to understand what sort of tension like you need to provide the muscles to to keep the skeleton like uh, walking, right? And they used machine, uh, a machine learning um, algorithm to train these models uh, in order to walk. And they also gave them a certain targets, like to like go to a certain speed and stuff like that. And these are all the generations of the 
uh, of the machine learning like setup, right? You see, like generation 921 is just like he's got it, uh, and here like you can see like sort of like a giraffe. Uh, he's like, oh my god, like, look at this, this is pretty good. This is my favorite one, look at generation 80. He's like, he's almost got it. He, or he's like really, really lucky. Uh, look at that, he's like really there and rocking. Like, oh, no, 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 no. And then it's like, yeah. <laughs> and then um, what is great is that, as I said, like, you, you, they optimize you for a certain target speed. So for example, for a human being, they said like this certain speed, and when you increase the speed, you see the guy's like, starts, like sort of running, right? Which is, you know, expected. Um, but what happens if you try to apply this to other type of animals with like other st like bone structure, basically, with like, um, you can see like this guy like sort of like is still able like to run. But for an animal like this, um, what would you guys think like is the best way to run, <laughs> right? Like the, the model itself like n understands, uh, well, if we can say understands in a certain way that this is the best way for this model to run. You can watch the whole video, it's like great. Like, at some point it goes on into like simulating um, like, uh, oh no, it's not here. Oh yeah, like simulating an environment. So <laughs> it tries like to throw stuff at the thing and the thing has to like counterbalance. <laughs> And or like altering gravity. So have you ever guys like seen like the pictures on the moon, right? Um, and it's like freakingly similar. Um, okay, back. Let me just find. Okay, cool. Now I got it. Um, so when it, the first time I saw this, I was like, wow, this is like really impressive. I want to do something like this. Um, and I really wonder to, un to understand like how does the whole thing work. And uh, so what I did is just like follow the Coursera course on machine learning, which is really nice. I really recommend like if you if you find this sort of stuff interesting, I think you should definitely start with that one. And basically, the like the, the core idea is that uh, like there's like a definition which is like formal, and then like the actual definition is that a computer program is learning to perform a task when its performance can be measured by a metric which improves the experience. So basically, you teach the machine how to do it, how to do something, you teach him how to understand like, how well it's doing this certain thing, and then you keep repeating this process. So for example, like, when you're playing chess, it could be like, look at all the previous matches that were ever played by human beings, and then you try to play against this uh, program and see like, how well it fares. Or they, this is like another classic machine learning uh, sort of like recognized task, which is to recognize Obama's face in pictures. You just like provide a ton of pictures, and the, um, the algorithm has to understand if there is Obama in it. This is also a good application for Terminator, I guess. Um, and for something more serious, it could be like something as serious as uh, tumor prediction. So you take a historical data, so at pictures of tumors, uh, x-rays, scans, and you associate these scans with the fact that if, like, the tumor is malignant or benign. And then you measure like, how accurate you are. And it's pretty insane to think about it. So usually all these things uh, work in a very similar way, which is um, there's always a sort of training set. So uh, some, some sort of way that we teach the algorithm like, what is right. Um, then there's this uh, feature, like there's this process called feature selection, where in all the data which is uh, there in the training set, you just select the features that you think are important. And the last part is the test set. So basically, you just like take a little bit of your training set and you just like keep it on the side and you just use it to check if your model is accurate. Because the problem with the training set is that if you just use the whole training set, you train an algorithm. The, like you, can, you could train possibly an algorithm which just like matches 100% of the training set, right? But that's not what we're trying to do. We're trying to build a model which then we can apply to the real world. So what we use the test set for is just like to have a sort of reality check. Like it, are we doing like something which is like real? Like it, will it actually work in the real world or not? Mm, so there's two like big types of uh, machine learning algorithms and they're called supervised and unsupervised and usually on the ones on the left we are telling the machine okay this is the right answer and you have to learn how to tell if this is like w w what the answer is so for example spam detection is a supervised task right because we have a lot of emails and we tell the machine okay this is spam this is not spam on the other hand like we we have something like which is called unsupervised which means that 
honestly, as humans, we don't really know every time what the right answer is. And to imagine it would be, let's say you have a program uh, which is called Google News. And the goal of Google News is to uh, scour the internet for every sort of news and article. And then you want to have a front page of this product we hypothetically call Google News. And we want to show all these articles, like all the articles which sort of belong to the same topic, we want to group them together. And when you load Google News, it actually, you'll see that it actually does this. So for every big news, there's links from newspapers like all around the world. And they have an algorithm which is doing this clustering operation. It's trying to understand what is this article talking about and grouping them all together, um, which is pretty impressive. Um, so like the, the, the more like, uh, well-known like, techniques in supervised learning called linear regression, uh, we'll see like, we'll also like a couple of examples of this, and logistic regression and neural networks. Uh, well, instead, for example, for the unsupervised ones, like they're really useful for like doing this sort of clustering, um, for doing anomaly detection. So, like you want to understand if there is something wrong at some point, and for uh, another th uh, operation which is called dimensionality reduction, uh, which means basically that in a lot of these machine learning tasks, there's so many features, right? Like there's like you're considering like uh, to predict the price of a house, and there's 25 different factors that could uh, impact uh, the price of this house. But then you want to draw um, a table or a graph to represent it. And our human brain is not able to process a graph built in 25 dimensions. So usually they use these sort of techniques to try to reduce the dimensions to two or three. And just to show, OK, these are the main factors of this, um, of this model. So uh, linear regression is something which is pretty, like, the idea is very simple. So let's say, like, I showed you uh, a graph like this. This is, uh, like, profit in, in ten thousands of dollars and populations of cities in ten thousands of people. And I show you all this axis, and I would ask you then, like, to predict, okay, what happens if someone is, like, around 17? I would say, like, well, probably, like, somewhere in this area, right? And I would say it's something like that. And if you run the algorithm on it, you'll do, yeah, that's like pretty much true. Um, but as I said before, imagine if this problem was in 15 dimensions. Would you be able like, to point with your hand like, where the optimum is or where what the prediction is? Like Our human brains are incredibly um, skewed towards two, three di dimensions, sometimes four if you're good. Um, but other than that, you're... You just like you can't even imagine where it is, uh, and instead, if you use a numerical app, like approach, it just like works just as well, like with like ten thousand dimensions. Um, so uh, actually, like, logistic regression is just about like predict uh, linear regression is about predicting a number, and logistic regression is about predicting a boolean. So for example, here we have these two sets. It's like uh, test about like microchip sizes and stuff like that, and you see we have like. Uh, um, y equals zero, y equals one, and like here, like we can still figure out that probably uh, the best way to describe that is that circle, and the same uh, like the same reasoning applies here. Like we could do this because it's in two dimensions. If it was in ten thousand dimensions, which is not something like out of this world, like every sort of like modern machine learning techniques like deals with like hundred thousands of features, um, so you couldn't do that possibly. Um, the last thing I want to talk about um, are called neural networks. And if there's like only one thing uh, you'll remember, like, I, I hope you can remember after tonight is just like this. So uh, y usually you always say that like, neural networks are uh, structured after like our neurons. And because our neurons have uh, a nucleus, they have these like little um, um, dendrites. And where they like they use as inputs, and then they emit one output through the axon. So if you think about a neuron, is like this uh, entity which has a lot of inputs and emits one single signal, which usually is like either high or low, so one or zero. Um, and don't be scared, please. Um, so uh, this is like really like the same thing, just expressing like, a more mathy situation, right? Like you have a transfer function, you have a lot of inputs, and then you have some sort of like activating function. I don't know what it is, and then we have a single output. 
Um, the activation function actually is really important. You don't really need to care about the maths like behind it, but it's just that the shape of the thing is interesting. It's just like this sort of S, right? And what uh, we care about, like this uh, special function, is that if we pass something which is greater usually than 4, it goes to 1. If we pass something which is less than minus 4, it goes to 0. You just need to care about that, right? It's a function where you pass something which is like 4 or more, it goes to 1. Something uh, less than minus 4, it goes to 0. So what if I told you that this is actually the implementation of uh, uh, OR gate using this neural network? And we have these uh, two inputs. This is called the bias function. So it's like something we always add. It's minus 10. And instead, here are just like Boolean values, right? So we have x1 and x2. And what we do there is just we multiply this value by this, this value by this, with some minus 10, and we plug it into the activation function. So, right, so we can try together, right? It's like 0, 0 is, means uh, 0, 0 minus 10. And as we remember, minus 10 is less than minus 4, so it goes to 0. Uh, if we try this, it will be um, 20 minus. Uh, 20 minus 10, 10, which is greater than 4, it goes to 1. Same thing for this. And here it goes like uh, 40 minus 10, 30, which is greater than 4, 1. So this is actually the neural network which implements an OR gate. Um, and as you can implement OR gate, you can implement AND gates, you can implement uh, XOR gates. And the, like, basically, when you can implement like, the logic gates, you can do everything in programming. And in production, basically, you see net neural networks which look more like this, right? I think the um, neural network, one of the two neural networks which was used uh, in AlphaGo has uh, 16 layers. And uh, one thing to note, notice that is the first uh, layer is called input layer, and the layers which are in the middle are called hidden layers. And in the hidden layers, actually, they store the actual brain of the algorithm, like the actual, like, uh, like these parameters which are stored in the hidden layers are actually what are controlling the intelligence of the neural network. And in the end, they just emit an output. So, uh, okay, cool. I just wanted to show you this thing which comes back from 1991. Uh, it's this guy which is called Jan Le Kuhn, which is the grandfather of all machine learning and now uh, works at Facebook as their um, machine learning center. Oh, really? Oh, no. They started in 91. Or maybe I'm just like mistaken. Uh, is it working? Oh, come on. Yeah. Nice. And then like, he's like really happy about it. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe we can cut there. <laughs> I mean, I can't blame him. But <laughs> um, OK. No, I lost my mouse again. How is it possible? OK, got it. OK, cool. So how much time do we have? Like five minutes? Yeah. Yeah, cool. So uh, I just, oh, wow, that would be maybe, well, I won't show this video, but uh, you should watch it. It's basically. Um, a clip from 2001 uh, Space Odyssey, and they trained a neural network on Picasso's paintings, and they applied it on top of the movie as a filter. So basically, there's a whole clip of the movie which goes through, like this movie seen through Picasso's eyes, which I think is pretty sweet. Um, so I just want to do a quick demo because uh, I thought it wasn't like really fair, like to show like all these like uh, like bright things without like. Nothing like serious. Um, so uh, let me just disable display arrangement, mirror displays. Cool. Awesome. So um, this is my React server running. Um, can you guys see? Right? OK? A yeah. bit bigger? Good? Yeah. So, uh, for example, like the thing um, I was showing you guys before uh, about the um, supervised learning. Uh, 
Where is it? OK, wow. Uh, yeah, cool. So like this is the, um, the same example I showed you before. And on the right, there's like Octave, which is this open source version of MATLAB, which is running. And it just like uh, prints out like the, this, is like the result of the linear regression. And uh, it's just like this straight line, right? Uh, which is not like particularly interesting. Uh, what I think is quite interesting instead is to see um, how like actually like this thing is calculated. So like the algorithm basically builds this sort of uh, 3D representation of like where the optimal points are. And basically, it starts at any point here and slowly goes down to the bottom of the valley. And there is this uh, mathematical formula and this mathematical process which sort of ensure you, well, it's not like you're not 100% like sure, but they give you enough confidence that you've reached a certain minimum. Uh, of that graph, maybe it's like not like the absolutely like, mm, like mm, best minimum, but it is a minimum. And usually, you can structure a problem so that you're pretty confident you've reached like the end of it. Um, and as I said, like this thing which is run on these two dimensions, it could be run like on a hundred dimensions. Like and the and the mathematical formula works just as well. It's just differential equation, differential equations. Yeah. So. Yeah, it is. Yeah. So, um, and then like this is like another way of representing this sort of problem because basically, uh, w like with our eyes, like this, um, we can see like this is like uh, the various like slices of the cake. It's like sort of like how we represent terrain, right? And like you can see like here is like the highest, or well, in this case, like the lowest part. And how the uh, algorithm operates it, it starts in any random point and tries to, like to move around and see like if it's like going in the right direction. And then when as soon as it realizes it's not moving anymore, it, it tells us, okay, I probably have found uh, like a local minimum. Um, okay, which is good. Um, octave. And here, like, oh, whoa, that's too much. So and th this is like the, the other thing I showed you before. So it's really similar. So it just like runs the logistic regression on top of that. Um, yeah. It tried. OK, good. And it just like calculates this circle. So and all this is like MATLAB code, which just runs. Um, it's really fun. So you should try it. Um, what I did on my own is to uh, try to use um, an open source Python. Um, framework, which is called uh, Theano. Uh, but you probably you've, like, you've heard about TensorFlow, and uh, Theano is something really similar. Uh, there is another library which is called Keras, which uh, acts as a uh, level of abstraction. So you can both use Theano and TensorFlow. And you don't have to change your code, you just change basically the adapter. And what this does is it um, does the digital recognition that we saw in the video. So if I just do Python NIST, well, I print out some stuff. And uh, this is like the, the, um, the test set data. So there's uh, 60,000 images. They're all 28 by 28 pixels. Each one of the pixels uh, is treated as an input in the neural network. So basically, this uh, neural network has uh, 700, I think it's, it's written somewhere, uh, some, uh, let's say 700 inputs. And then there's this uh, thing which is running, which is trying to optimize the like, accuracy rate of the recognition. And you see, like after like four epochs, it goes to uh, ninety. Where is it? Yeah, uh, ninety-seven point ninety-seven point six. Um, which I think, like from the papers I've read, is really close to the human accuracy. And I just like trained it for like 10 seconds. And this is like how the best humans can do this task. And um, like most like modern um, algorithms, when like are trying to solve this problem, they can achieve like 99.4. Uh, like accuracy on these tasks, and like the, the reason why the algorithms like make mistakes is because like the, the data isn't perfect, right? So for example, like sometimes the algorithm makes some makes a mistake because he thinks that uh, this is a two, and probably yeah, I could guess it's a four, but it doesn't really look that much like a four to be honest. And what is this? <laughs> so <laughs> like here, like he predicts a zero is well, actually a six. So you can't really like blame the algorithm that much. Um, and instead, when the algorithm works, uh, it looks like quite good. So 
Um, no, yeah, it looks something like this. No, this isn't the prediction. It's there somewhere. Oh yeah, it's here. So this like the when the algorithm gets it right, and he recognizes this is a five, which is, is pretty creative. Um, so, and if I had to show the code of this, it's quite simple. Uh, um, no, I think I have to close the Python graphs. Okay, got it. And it's just missed. No, stupid them. Pi. And well, I just keep like how the data is important and all that. But basically, there's, this is like the heart of the whole thing. Um, it's creating a neural network where um, there's like 784 input, uh, la uh, like um, inputs, and then there's a hidden layer of 512 nodes. There's another one like that, and then like this is like the output layer. Since the, this is called a classification problem because we're trying to understand which one of the 10 digits it is, so it needs like 10 outputs just like to try to understand that. Uh, but as you see, it's pretty simple. Like the library like, makes like everything like really simple. And then basically the way that you like run it, you just say uh, model fit. You pass the training data. You pass the uh, output in the training. You say like. A couple of like options, and like for example, in this case, I've passed the validation data so that the algorithm is able to understand if it's like proceeding in the right direction or not. Um, okay, cool. So let me just go back. Um, I think I, I lost. Oh, no, cool. So yeah, I just wanted to show this very last video, which I think is is really nice. So, like this guy programmed. Oh boy. Okay, nice. Having some trouble with those menus. So, this game does not work well at all, and that's not surprising. Uh, playing Tetris well requires some thinking ahead, and this algorithm does not think very far ahead. There it was, pausing the game for no reason. And I think the reason it stacks up the blocks like that. Um, which is the worst possible Tetris strategy, is that it gets three points or so when it puts a block on top of another block. So this is really bad, greedy planning. And let's force fast forward a bit to see how this all ends. It's not good. So now it's almost done and pauses the game because as soon as he unpauses, he will lose. And really, the only winning move is not to play. Thank you. And so I just like ended with, oh, this is like something that Will sent me before. So I just like put it here. Oh no, the robots are killing us, but why? He was never programmed to do this. And you'll notice that there's a little bug in the code. <laughs> so just be careful there. Never do this, like, uh, the, the, you can do like the Yoda assignment. So just put true on the left and like this will fail and you won't kill all the humans in the world. So, and yeah, that's it. <laughs> Sorry, I was like a bit long. <laughs>